And just let me give you two examples of that, the kind of verbal warning. I mean, we're all familiar with the idiot on the television who says, um, well, there's no such thing as man-made verbal warming. Now, of course, what you have here is something that should be known to all students, the phenomenon of cognitive dissonance, which politically is the most important psychological phenomenon that there is. And cognitive dissonance can be summed up by saying that nobody can be led to believe anything if believing it means a cut in his salary. <laughs> right, and that's how cognitive dissonance this works. Of course, with global warming, you get these people whose subconscious logic is to say, if there is man-made global warming, my company will suffer a loss in profit. Therefore, there is no such thing as man-made global warming. I mean, it's very, very simple. We can all understand it in a way. It does require a little bit of critical thinking, but this is rather an important bit of critical thinking because unless enough people have it, we are actually doomed eventually for planetary catastrophe. <coughs> Or take another example, expenditure on Trident, replacing Trident at 70 billion pounds. Now, you, you really do here need people who can think, because it's obvious, if you can think, if you're not drawn into groupthink, which is what the politicians are, and the whole of the British establishment is, that first of all, most countries in the world don't have nuclear weapons, and yet remain perfectly safe. I mean, has anybody ever, well, I won't go into it, but I mean, most countries in Europe do not have nuclear weapons. Um, are they dangerous? Is it, is it, you get anxious when you, you go to Switzerland? Or, anyway, um, also it's obvious we can't, we can't preach to other countries not to have nuclear weapons if we're actually increasing ours, that's obvious. It's also a breach of the Non-Proliferation Treaty. It's also completely useless militarily, and even the senior military people say that. It's a, it's a huge sum of money. The Senate was against the Russians. Now the Russians are no longer so wicked and, well, we just got to find some other reason for having it, which consists of saying, well, you never know what might happen. Um, but there's none of those things are the real reason. And if you have any historical sense or critical awareness, you know what the real reason for replacing Trident is. It's about a certain mindset held in place by groupthink, which imagines that Britain is still number one nation. We've still got this empire. We're still really important. And our diplomats, if we've got Trident, can't sit at the top table in global discussions. I mean, what a catastrophe for all of us that would be, wouldn't it? Um, and don't ever go and live in one of those countries that doesn't have diplomats on the top table because they haven't got nuclear weapons, because I can tell you, you'll be really miserable if you do that. So stay here and pay dearly for this ludicrous replacement of Trident nuclear weapons. Now, um, it really is basically that simple in principle. Um, it's all about groupthink, and these are things which anybody who has any critical understanding of the world will be able to understand. It, so critical thinking could actually save the government a lot of money, quite apart from saving the world from, uh, from climate change and the consequent catastrophes. Now, I'm a historian and said, well, I'm a professor of ancient Greek, but I, one of the things I study is the origins of democracy, so I have quite strong views about, demo about democracy. But first let me say something in general about public expenditure on what you might broadly call the humanities. One of those things that makes life worth living, that can save us from passive atom atomistic consumerism. And if you look at history, you see certain great periods in history. Task of Athens, I think, is a pretty great period for that wonderful architecture, that amazing philosophy and literature. Now, I have to tell you, that was a period of enormous public expenditure the Parthenon, the great tragedies, they all were a result of a level of public expenditure far higher in proportion to overall wealth than anything that we have. They didn't just build themselves, they weren't um, financed out of fees. Or Renaissance Italy, or just take Exeter Cathedral. Now these things were often funded through the monarchy, through rich individuals, or through the church, but it's still all public expenditure. The great periods of history culturally are based on public expenditure. So it's true that maybe in the 10th century AD in Britain wasn't a great time, didn't have much public expenditure. But all the great periods are built, culturally, are built on public expenditure. Um, or take, for example, universities. English universities, say, between the 13th and 15th, 16th centuries, when they were just get, getting going. This was basically Oxford and Cambridge. You have all those wonderful buildings and those colleges and 
himself. That wasn't funded from fees. That was public expenditure. George Osborne would be horrified by Greek tragedy, by the Parthenon, by, by all those beautiful colleges in Oxford and Cambridge and all the learning that went on in them. So the fact of the matter is that in cutting off collective expenditure for what makes us a community is, in a sense, historically unprecedented. Now, is our, is our era a great period in the way that Classical Athens and <coughs> Renaissance Italy was? Well, in many respects we're not doing very well, in some respects we're doing pretty well. I think the respect in which we're doing extremely well is in our level of understanding of the world, both science and society, <coughs> and above all, in our making that understanding accessible to anybody who can benefit from it, and above all, propagate it. Now, there's been no period in the past in which we've been able to do that. And this is what makes our era distinctive. That is the, the only kind of thing that is both permanent and wonderful that we are creating. It is precisely this enormous increase in understanding and the way in which it's made accessible to everybody who wants to and is able to benefit from it and pass it on to others and create a community of understanding. We are very special in that respect. And that is precisely the area within the universities that these, the Philip Greens and their political supporters are savaging, are in effect attempting to um, annihilate. And that's sort of historically unprecedented. Even though, as I say, yet again, the sum required for it is compared to other things uh, minuscule. Now I want to end up by just saying something about space. I said something about democracy, but space is very important for democracy. And as I say, one of the things I study is ancient Athens in the 5th century BC, which is the origin of, of democracy. And there's a bizarre consequence that you have Mrs. Thatcher praising 5th century Athens. I mean, she would be horrified by that, because 5th century Athens was a society in which there was masses of public expenditure, enormous suspicion of individual wealth, and so on. Now, um, I was in Oxford Street at the weekend, and I was walking down Oxford Street, which I think got lost, as I try to avoid Oxford Street usually, and there was a lot of PAC going along, sort of dazed people looking at shop windows. But at the end of Oxford Street, there was Top Shop, <coughs> and there a space had been created, a different kind of space. It was electric, it was energizing, because a lot of, of um, I take it, students and school students had got there, and they were they were chanting, they were handing out leaflets, and they were making a very simple point. It's because billionaires like Philip Green don't pay their taxes, and that the government and our politicians are feckless in trying to recover that money, that these cuts, or a, a large part of these cuts, are necessary, and that a big hole could be plugged by what's called filling the tax gap. Tax gap being the difference between what is owed in tax and what is collected. And these people have really got the right idea. Because they're not just saying they're not just saying we're against the cut, they're saying the money is there. It's just going more and more into the pockets of the very rich. That's precisely that's precisely the method that should be said. So you, they have all above all created this space that was like drawing people in. It's a different kind of space. And I know from history you cannot have democracy unless you have communal space. One reason why the USA has turned out to be such a disaster, they have even less communal space than we do. And, um, of course, Athens is a small society. In Athens, everybody can get together in the same place, or most people. I know there are defects in the Athenian democracy, but basically, the whole society can get together and feel itself as a community, as a society. That's why it's much more egalitarian and, and culturally superior to our own. And we can't do that because we have this enormous space over the British Isles. But sometimes people try to do it, and that's why it's particularly sinister that now people just gathering together in one space is regarded by you know, the zombie media and, and various other people as, as a threat, in itself a threat. So you have Kettling, which is an, really an attempt to deter people from just getting together in the same space, because there's a sense that by doing that people are creating a new kind of energised reality devoted to understanding and action, which is a threat to the PAC and the Philip Greens of this world. So I'll, I'll end by congratulating you, because you have carved out this space. It may not seem much, but it is significant. 
you have out of space here in this occupation in which to see things as a whole. And whatever you achieve or fail to achieve, you've already contributed to a model which, if our society is to survive, it will have to follow. Thank you very much. Thank you.